it's uh, really nice to be here in Tallinn. It's the weather is like in home in back in Finland. <laughs> Uh, a little bit about my background, uh, oh sorry, a little bit your, about your background. 85% of the startups will fail within the first two years. That's a worldwide fact. Typically, the startups go against, uh, do their idea. They just want to implement what the idea is. They don't want to evolve. And I'm going to touch those subjects a little bit in, the, in, the, in my presentation. Less than 10% of the startups are able to raise external financing. Typically, startups think that the external financing is the key to the success. It's just an enable on the path to building a sustainable companies. And I'm going to touch also that how can you actually evolve your path to enable you to raise some financing. About my background, as, as mentioned, I started my company when I was 18 years old in high school, took that to about 120 million turnover, sold it, uh, became and uh, started on the way a few companies, uh, educated my backwards, and, and today I'm working with startups full time. I'm a full time angel and trying to enable companies to startups become successful. I have evaluated about 1,000 startups both in Finland, mainly Finland, Sweden, few Estonians, couple in uh, Silicon Valley, et cetera. Invested about a little bit more than 30 startups. And I, I have a personal mission, really. I, I want to help in the yearly about 30 startups to become successful, either as through investing or mentoring or just helping, helping them Establishing, establishing connections or networks, and, and if you have a startup, I'm, I'm, I'm available. I, I'm a cheap, my price is normally a cup of coffee, nothing more. Hmm. Yep. Quit. <laughs> Can you? Hit the button next. Yeah. Uh, a couple areas what I'm going to touch. Why the startups fail, what the investors look at the startups, and, and what kind of investors are there. There are loads of different kind of investors in the, in the market, and most of the startups just go like the investors, some of the in investors, they just go out, out, spray and pray that they meet the right one. That's the, typically the wrong way to find your investor. Could you hit the next one? Some of the subjects I'm, I'm, I'm going to touch actually was Patrick covered. What I have found that typically startups go through five stages. There's the idea invention. Next stage is the hallucination. Then you have the externally shared vision when you begin to actually meet the customers, begin to get the feedback from the customers. And after that begin, becomes the business validation. And if, if you are extremely success, success, successful, it, com, it becomes an innovation. On the way there, there's always money needed. The raising capital is a hard job. And it will distract you from those paths. And it might cause reasons that you can process on the different stages. Next one. Yep, he did more. <laughs> yeah, what what the each stage requires, like product thinking, change in your product thinking. It's like uh, well, Patrick told that you need to do loads of canvases. We typically with the start, startups we work, we do every stage almost every week. We evo uh, evolve and do new canvases. We try to figure out what have we learned on the past week. That's a standard process what I do with all the startups I work with. Every week we go and look at the canvas. What it, have we learned something what changed the story? It, it, it requires customer development. Why are you finding who are your customers? Typically the original customers, what you thought, are not the customers. You'll find those in different areas, different people, different uh, business model development. You need to have a team development. Typically, you start with the small teams, one, two, three people. 
To build a company, you don't have the competencies yet in that team. You might have the competence to develop the idea, but to take a company to maybe 20 people is totally different than a company of two, three people. Taking that to 100 people in multiple countries, it is again a challenge of growing up, learning things. Some entrepreneurs are able to do that. Some entrepreneurs have to bring outside people in the team to enable them to grow. Administration, uh, the metrics. We didn't, uh, Patrick didn't speak that much about metrics. What the metrics you start on hallucination are different metrics that when you go in real business. And the old metrics are become a vanity metrics. They don't mean anything. You have to be able to evolve your metrics. How do I keep track that I'm developing? How do I de keep track that my thinking is evolving? And, and, and then the financing. Each of the stages require different kind of fin financing. Uh, the, what was it called, the Patrick the Batchin, so what it was, that was a great example on, on the financing. Investor looked on that row and remembers, yeah, 250,000, and then they're building a big factor with 350,000. Great investment for investor because it doesn't demand on huge financing. Each of the stages required a different kind of financing. And common mistake what I see with loads of startups is that they are in hallucination stage and they are pitching money that they would have a business validation stage. It doesn't, in the investor's eyes, it, there's a conflict. These guys are still too far away and they think the money will solve their problem. Too much money will create problems. Because companies with limited funding are more, actually more successful than the companies with the unlimited funding. Ideas. Ideas are just a multiplier of the execution. I have loads of ideas. I can only implement a few. Startups, there are people, as uh, Patrick mentioned, billions of people have the ideas. But only few can implement those and get those in reality. Loads of startups think the idea is value. And you can't, if the startup can't execute, the idea will not materialize. It is, you have to learn to crawl before you can run. That is true in any business. Corporations can think differently. They have resources, but the startup, there's always the crawling, the walking, the running phase. Even my last startup, which we started two years ago, we went through all these stages. We, we had to learn because the business situation is always different. The markets where we're going. We thought, I have been doing angel investing professionally for five years. I thought everything, I, I know it. But when we went on deeper, we learned new things and you had to evolve your business idea. And I, the companies I have met and the, some of the successful companies, they have gone through these different stages. They have, even they did the same business than they did before. The market around, the world around us changes so fast. Why startups fail? Uh, this is a startup genome in a report. They did the research on uh, a little bit over 3,000 startups. It's premature scaling. Startup thinks that they are in the business validation phase when they're actually still in hallucination. They try to begin to stop the learning and begin the selling when they sh still should be focused on the learning and not in the selling. Startups. Early stage startups don't ever have a problem with selling. Your mission is not to sell. The easiest way to learn is to fail in selling and try to understand why did I fail. That's a con quite contrary to what loads of people think that the yeah, startup's mission is to generate turnover. No, startup's mission is to generate learning, which you then in certain stage can actually turn into turnover. Uh, business model canvas, etc., work quite a lot on, on, on the theories and, and give us a quite good tools to work through 
different ways. Typical perception is really is that there's a problem, there's a solution, there's competition, then there's a market. And, and it starts from the scale and, and, and the product market fit is really in the last one. In reality, the world is, again, <laughs> yeah, in, in reality, the world is actually vice versa. And it's, it's learning loops all, all the way. It's a continuous learning. Uh, I took my company from, uh, for about 20, I worked for that 27 years. Uh, why the company was, was able to live that long time in the extremely competitive area was that at certain stage we came, became the learning again. We're in the business with the market leader and we had to learn again how to be, stay in the market leader. How the competition was changing, you have to be continuous learning. In startup, the learning has to happen really fast. Corporations has an option and cash flow to do slow learning. Startups don't have that opportunity. You have to do the learning. You have to do the learning really fast. And, and you have to analyze and, and put that into action. Competition. There is no competition. Any company has a competition. It has, I do not do nothing. The company, the customer has always option not to make a decision. And that is the biggest competition any startup is facing. That's, that is the most common decision the customer does. Then the, really, the second one is that there's other ways to solve the problem. There's no one solution for that problem. There are multiple solutions. And, and you, your offer is just one of the solutions. You are competing. It's not an exactly same copy of your product. It might look and feel a bit different, but it is solving the same problem point. Third typical choice for customers is that we do it ourselves. It's not that big thing, especially if your customer is a corporation. They have resources, they have the money, they can buy the knowledge. It's time to market really is just a question. How fast do I need to get that to the market to solve this problem? And, and, and then the fourth, which mostly people say, oh, I don't have a direct competition. Yeah, it's the guys doing the, almost the same product, solving the exact same problem. But that is really low on the problem list of competition. You have to convince the customer that he gets better deal than if he makes the decision and not does do not postpone the decision. We used to uh, heard a few quotes from uh, Steve Plank. It's, uh, I, I, I quote this most of times. The difference between winners and uh, winning startups and those who, who lose is that the winners know why customers buy. The losers never do. I, I have looked through excess of thousand startups. Guess how many have asked me, why did I not invest? Thousand startups, eight people. Eight people have asked me, how, why did I not invest in their startups? And I would have been there like, uh, in that situation, I'm, I'm technically the customer. They want my money to their company. And, and they're not interested why I don't invest. It's really strange. It's, it's for me, a customer refusing to buy is a great resource of information. Not to push the deal through, but understand what did go wrong. The only thing I can change is what I'm doing. I can't change what other people are thinking. I can change, I can change my pitch, I can change my thinking, but, and the customer, but if I don't listen to the customer, I, I won't be doing it. Okay, what do we think when we look at the companies? Uh, typical misconception of a pitch is that you want to get the deal done. No investor is going to make a decision on the first meeting, not even the second meeting, not even on the third meeting. The only mission with the pitch when you face the investor is get him interested, get him to the next meeting. That's the only mission what you have. And the next meeting, the mission is to get him to the next meeting. And then next meeting. And then will you go deeper and deeper. What we are looking when we are 
looking at, at, at the startups. I, I, to help some of the entrepreneurs here, I try to put this on a little bit like a pitch deck, and on a pitch deck, uh, deck structure. Typically, we are looking on the problem. Is there a real problem? Whose problem is it? Is it someone else's, or is it the person who is going to pay for that? And, and that's an, an non-alignment what we find in many pitches. Yeah, there is a problem, but the who we ex expect to pay for that is not the person owning the problem. A challenging thing. Uh, how many customers would in the world have, that, have this problem? Are there in the world 100 companies that are having that problem, or are there thousands of companies having this problem? That, that uh, gives us perspective. How big would that market be? Are there other ways to solve this problem? If you are solving a problem on, on a basically going out tonight, there are loads of different ways. It's you're competing with the movies, so the sports, etc. Are there other things, other companies addressing the same pain point? They, they might be totally different. Uh, companies typically say there is no competition. It, it takes about roughly five minutes to find the competition. And if you can't put the name on that, you can say, okay, then the competition, they don't do anything. They just, it's not enough big problem for them. And, and has the problem been validated? It's looking from a lot of people coming from a corporate, uh, corporate perspective, a corporate, big corporations. It's two different worlds, be, being in a startup, being in, in a, in a uh, big corporation. Startups solve small problems. How you eat elephant, piece by piece. You can't go to solve the world first. You can have a big vision, but you start from a small problem and growing that to a bigger problem. Uh, can it work in theory? You have loads of things. Corporations, it's about execution. There is a product market fit, there is custom validation, someone has done that before, et cetera, et cetera. It's a totally different ball game. Uh, people coming from a big corporations should forget everything they learned in the company. And I start from a scratch. How did we are going? How do we begin to crawl? How is this going? And not to try to run on the first stage on a startup. How much value does this, if you solve the problem, how much value does it add? If it doesn't add value, no one is going to buy it. It has to add value on the buyer's perspective. If the value add is too small, mm, you, we will get too little money for that sol solving that problem. Or it, it's a good choice that they don't buy it at all. What are the drawbacks? If you solve this problem, are there drawbacks? Some of the ideas have a huge drawbacks. Or well, I solved this problem, but the new problem to the customer surface is have you, have you looked at those? Uh, what, what are there? Uh, what are, does your solution meet one of the three must-have conditions? Uh, there are three, three must-have conditions what the, what the good problem or good solution has to meet. You can't, typically some of the startups say, we meet all of these three. No, startup can only meet one of these. Big corporation might be able to pro deliver product which meet this. But you have to have one of these. Is it, does it enable un previous unavailable strategic uh, capability? Does it improve the performance? Or does it visibly uh, verifiably reduce the current cost? Uh, I have a startup which had the product which reduces cost by 90%. From 90% the cost reduction, not enough. It can be that 90% cost reduction is not enough to create a business. And then you have to go back on this, okay, now do I actually address one of the other these areas must have conditions. Solution. We look, what are you doing? Is your solution scalable in all areas? 
Typically, it's startup focused that the solution is scalable and technology wise. That is not actually the problem what we are looking or the thing we are looking. Technology can be built, it can be both. Are you scalable and sellable sale -wise, sales wise? Are you actually doing SaaS or are you actually going consulting business? It's totally different scalability. What is your sales process? What's your customer validation? How you approach your customer's process? What's the team? If you're a close-knit team, are you, can you grow? We know that you need to grow. We need to bring more people in that team. And, and some of the teams are closed. They don't uh, allow other people coming in. Because it, it's a threat of the existing. Uh, and, and really going back on the problem, is it really, really solving this problem? And the only one who can say that you are solving the problem is the customer. There was a question, should we go out before the product? Yes, you should go out. There is no product you can't go out. I haven't seen yet. And ask the customer. Because your mission is not to sell, your mission is to learn. You can't sell without the product, but to learn you can. Uh, I, have a customer, I have a startup which is, uh, they have now met 20 customers in the last three weeks. They got 15 deals. The customer really committed to buy the product. And after the customer signed the purchase contract, we went and told the customer, yeah, by the way, we don't even have the product existing. It will be ready sometime in 2014. But this was an experiment, and because you helped us with the experiment, we, we're going to give you free of charge a product for next year when it's ready. We had to thank them. We, we really pushed the deal as it would be real world. Because if you go and ask the customer, would you be interested on this? They always say, yes, I would. Come back when you have this feature. And what did you learn? Not a single thing. Just that they might not understand or did understand, but they might not ever buy it anyway. You want to get the realistic feedback from a customer. And sometimes you can't lie to them, you have to tell them the truth in the end, but you try want to push them as hard as possible in a realistic situation. And, and you have to take the risk. Some customers might get pissed, but it's, I believe the benefits to the startup are much more valuable than you lose one or two customers. That, that's my comment, yes, go out today. Get out of the building, now. <laughs> but yeah, it, it is. And team, do you really have a team? Uh, some of the teams and a little longer startups, we put through them a personality test. We know the team is not complete. Team is as good as the weakest link on the team is, and you need to complement that team with different knowledges. What longer you go, that more experienced people can you get in, that if you have a big vision, that more engaged and, and uh, motivated people you get, can get in. But it is always building the team. You have a, something where you start from and where you are going. Uh, do you have a le relevant experience on this project or this problem? If, if you have done being doing a games and you go, go on the business to business software, not that big relevance. That's a drawback to you. If you look, some of the startups getting large amount of funding, and you go and analyze the background of the people, they have done work before earlier, and they have a relevant experience to that problem what they are solving. It might be in different industries, it might be in different, but it's relevant, and it gives them a competitive advantage when they are building a startup. How long have you been together? Uh, according to Harvard, uh, Harvard University study, if a team has been longer than three years together, it is an actual an advantage. But if you are a homogeneous team, that you have all been the programmers in Nokia, it's a disadvantage. That you have worked together is an advantage, but if you have been working on the same thing in the same way, it's actual disadvantage. Uh, ownership split. How have you thought about the ownership of the company? And how, because that dictates a little bit the roles of the people in the company. A common mistake in a startup is that they split, uh, split the ownership equally. There are three owners, everyone gets one third. A bad mistake in the investor's perspective. 
There's no boss. There's no who is going to in the end make the call. You want that it's basically what's your input on this case. That's how you share how much you own the company in the beginning should be. It's not ever, we are not equal. And, and typically it is the idea people who, and that this is a hard discussion. And every startup we have been in, this discussion comes in one stage. I feel I, I should own more than you do. It's the startup teams doesn't survive without this discussion. And then people are putting, inputting more different things. Other ones are more committed, other ones are less committed. Other ones add more, other ones add less. And then what earlier you have this difference, that easier the discussions will go on. Uh, and one, one of the things what is a common, common thing, and today there is more emphasis, what do you understand what you need in the team? What is the competencies you need next? Is it the advisor side or the team member or investor? What kind of competencies? If, if you have a clear picture for next two years what you need, you are more interesting to the investor than a company that, yeah, I don't have a clue what I'm going to do next week. If you have a better view, vision, we always understand that it might not materialize what you think, but if you have a little perspective on what's going to happen next, there's more trust and belief that you have thought more about the, what's going, what are you want to do and what you are going to achieve. And on one of the most important things what we spend, it's uh, when we are investing in startups, we have uh, four people in, in basically in the company, my startup. We spend about three months that is the entrepreneur able to learn. It's, it's like, it's uh, one thing is that you, you play a game that you're able to learn, but are you actually really able to learn? What happens when you go to meet the customer? What is the report you bring back to us from the customer meet? Or oh, the customer was interested. Okay, what the heck did you learn? It's really what did you push, the, where were you able to push the customer to really reveal what he really thinks? Or were you able to read the weak signals, what he's giving you? And, and this is not the easy part. The problem, the solution, the market, etc., is easily being looked after. But how is the team and is the team capable of learning? That takes time. And, and sometimes we, we cause conflicts just to see how the startup entrepreneurs react. And, and the worst feedback to us is that, yeah, the, I don't care what you say, I'm right. That's when we walk out. Or, yeah, I hear what you say, but you don't know a thing. I was in, uh, in Silicon Valley mentoring in, uh, in uh, July, and there was a situation, a pitch event, and, and there was uh, investors, and they being to us from the entrepreneur, and he was building hardware. And entrepreneur began to ask for the investor that, yeah, you don't have a clue what you are talking about. And, and then, the, then the, basically, the, who was leading the discussion, he stopped now, this guy here, has built a hardware company which is making a half a billion turnover. He exactly knows about the question you, you don't know. And that's, that's a, like really the perception. Large number of startups and when we speak with them, they, yeah, you don't know. Yeah, we don't know exactly what your product is, but we typically know how the businesses are being built. And there's no, that, not that big difference between the industries. It's how the products are being built. There's a huge difference. And what is the business potential? Of course, investors want to invest in companies that have a huge business potential. Uh, I'm coming a little bit on the different type of uh, investors and how they're playing in, in, in shortly. But one, one of those really is that loads of companies dream about VC investments. But do they understand that VC wants to invest 20 million? You have to have a plan to spend 20 to 100 million? Because that's where the VC game is. They won't invest the companies a whole large amounts of money. If I have a company which doesn't meet the large amounts of money, the VC investor can be actual drawback. They are going to push your company in a way they, where it needs large investments, and etc. But we're coming a little bit on, on later on on the profiling of those. 
Uh, one of the things, and uh, did Patrick leave? Uh, criticizing on business model canvas, there's no place really for customer acquisition cost and customer lifetime value. For us, are you revenues, etc., they are just dreams, but we want to understand what is your customer acquisition cost? How much does it cost to get one paying customer? And how much is he going to produce in the lifetime he's going to pay you? Typically, these are that the customer acquisition cost is high and customer lifetime value is low. You are eating more than you are earning. Not good situation. It's uh, rarely it's that they are even. And, and I haven't really seen a case where it would be that the customer lifetime value really is higher than the customer acquisition cost. But you don't want to have a situation where there's a huge deviation. It means that your business model needs to be evolved. Uh, People building on, on business, business products, a custom acquisition cost start point is 1,000 euros. That's, I haven't yet seen a business to business. They are, I know they are, but the start cost where you have to try to figure out this custom acquisition cost is 1,000 euros. Is the customer lifetime value close to 1,000? There is the misconception that SaaS custom acquisition cost is low. Yeah, it goes lower, but it's, non, not, it's not ever non-existing. It's always still about in hundreds of years. And then comes the question, okay, you're asking for money. What amount are you asking for? What stage are you? Does this ask fit your stage you are? If you're on hallucination and asking for millions, mm, not a good way to go. Uh, you, do you have some business validation or shared vision? Not really business coming money, but you have, can show that customers, there's attraction, there is a conversion to the customers. It's a different stage. Or you, do you really have turnover, which is really a scaling stage, where you can actually ask loads of money? Because then the investors can calculate, the, I put one euro in, I get five euros out. It's, it's, it's worthwhile. And really, is, do you have the long-term financing plan? How much money am I going to need in the next two, three years? Rarely the startups have any clue of, of this. There should be some thinking going on. Or then the investor will do that for you. And, and then he figures, but it's always bet, better that you lead the discussion, and not the investor. One thing I rarely find that the startup entrepreneurs do their background work. A raising capital, you can count how many thousands of euros you get back in invested hour. Raising capital is, if you raise a million euros and you spend 100 hours on that, you were paid 10,000 euros an hour. That's the perspective of the importance of that issue. You have to do your background work. We had uh, last week slush, loads of startups running after money, and then you ask, okay, did you do a background check? What are they investing, et cetera? Where are they investing? No, I just went to a meeting. Waste of time on both sides. And typically, the investor remembers who wasted his time. You might get the second chance, but not the third one. Uh, one, when we see pitch decks, and really over the years we have been loads of pitch decks, I spent roughly on the first part with about three minutes. When you pitch the investor, my thinking on you is about three minutes. On that three minutes, the only thing you can convince, as I mentioned earlier, it's worthwhile to meet you again. That's the only thing what you, you don't want to sell your product because I, I'm not your customer. You just want to convince me it's worthwhile to meet the next time. And, and that's what the most of the investors do. There is a huge deal flow of companies wanting money, but there is no time to invest in all of those. There are different kind of investors. And I'm looking from a, little bit, uh, from a European perspective. Government is one. We have different grants, etc. cetera. Uh, most common investor group is the family, friends, and fools. Uh, 
That's where most of the startups get their bootstrapping money or basically first investment. Then typically there's the angel investors. Difference between angel investor and fools is, I, I was originally a fool, and I'm still sometimes a little bit fool, but it's, it, there's a really, the difference between fool and, and an angel investor is really small. Uh, there are industrial VCs. Uh, there are in, VCs investing in certain industries or certain type of exits, etc. And, and then there are the big VCs. Everyone dreams about the one billion DFJ fund or Axel or Atomicos investment. These guys are on certain kind of game, which I'm going to a little bit outline. And you have to understand what kind of player do you want to work with? What do you need? And, and, and of course, then there is the stock market. Rarely the startups get to the stock market, and it takes the year, years for that. What's important when you go and before you meet this investor is that really, what is his profile? Uh, today, there are plenty of sources on, for information. You have LinkedIn, you have uh, you do a Google search, and you can really fast in 10 minutes understand what are these guys doing? What are they going for? Fools, it's a nice hobby. It's something they made money in their business, and now this is a nice hobby. What do you do in a time? Oh, I go play golf, or I go to South. Yeah, okay, it's, it's more like a hobby. Uh, I went to meet the uh, New York Angels. The minimum person wealth value for them to get in the New York Angels was 50 million. And the, the, basically the chairman of New York Angels when asked, okay, why are you doing this? Yeah, this is great hobby. It, it, it was for them, it was a hobby. It was not a business. They were helping the entrepreneurs. Certainly it said it's a hobby because they, it was like a charity. They were giving people and hopes to return some money. Uh, there are people of, who are industry agnostic. They, and uh, this goes through on the VCs, angels, etc. They invest in certain industries. If you look an angel, look at his investments, and you really fast figure out that he's an industry agnostic, certain type of industries. If I have, if he is on business to business, and I have a consumer product, not worthwhile to speak with him, because he really rarely changes his industry where he invests. And this goes also on the VCs. There are a large number of industry agnostic VCs. Uh, there are industrial or business investors. Uh, it's a little bit like industrial agnostic, but they do a base that they want to buy new industries in. It's, it's like Qualcomm Ventures or Google Ventures is one of those. They invest to just look companies, and if it's an in, in, in trust, interesting business, they buy it in, even if it's not their industry at that stage where they were. And, and that's a large number of investors playing that game today. If you look at uh, stock market companies, most of them have a venture arm, which is looking just interesting things not related to their core businesses, but which might be, might be in the future in their core businesses. Uh, that's one. Or then there are business investors, really, who build great businesses. They don't care are they going to be exited or not. They build great business and structure the way they get the money back on that from that invest investment. And then there are a large number of investors and VCs who, who do a strategy called spray and pray. I try to choose the leading companies on their segment and invest only on those leading companies. And then there I do a large number of segments. I call it also lottery playing. The chances of winning are equal about lottery. And, and that's a one strategy. And you have to understand, as you have to understand your customer, what strategy does that investor follow? Uh, how much money does he have to invest? Is he in the investment mood? That's the first question when I'm helping my startups raising capital is that I ask, okay, do you have money to invest? When did you do your last investment? Or oh, I did that two years ago. Mm, okay, waste of time. He's not going to invest. And, and same thing with VCs. 
there is a VC has an investment period, typically four to five years. That's the four, uh, uh, four to five first years of the VC. He is not going to invest after that. He's going to invest on the companies he did before. And you have to check that is the fund on investment time still or not. It's not they, they run around, they go to the slush, they're not making investments, because they are raising next fund, and that might be next year investment. But they want to have the connection, what's going on. Same thing with the angels. They go in the events to just have a feeling, and they might not be raising money. Or sorry, not investing money at that stage, because they did just the new one invest. I typically do roughly about four or five investments a year. It means that every second month. I, can, I can't do much more. That's like what I have calculated. Yeah, I can do about this. If I have done all my five, and I have done those in June, I'm not going to invest for the next six months. I'm a waste of time to raise money. I still can't be taken out for a cup of coffee and, and have a chat, but it's then that's your ask. You need to want to get the information, not money. You have to understand this. Because this is like the same learning process what, what we were talking about on the customers. You have to understand where to raise, what's the right time. Because that guarantees the success of you raising money in right time. Yeah. Some of those I, I touched, what kind of exit strategy do they have? A big VC want to invest in 100 million with a multiplier of 10, you had to have a billion dollar exit. If you want to raise 10 million with multiplier of 10, you had to have a 100 million exit potential. Companies were trying to raise 10 million and have a 20 million exit potential. Don't add up that well. There's a huge misconception of what is the exit market in the US. In 2010, when Facebook went an IPO, the average exit in the US was 15 million euros. That's the average exit in the US in a year Facebook did the IPO. That most companies are actually exited under the 15 million, because you have the 100 billion, and then you have lots of companies in the, in the millions. That companies trying to raise tens of millions, and, and the average exit is 15 million, doesn't produce any money to the investors. When you share, and if you go begin to raise some money, one good advice is that ask references. Where did you invest previously? Is there anyone who I could call about? What kind of investor are you? Because there are good investors and there are, there are not so good investors who don't add value, really. They are not bad, but they don't add value. And there are a number of bad investors. Uh, there's an, uh, loads of different, and it's a, it's a personality game. You want to know what is the person you, want to, you are going to deal with. Even the angels, you have the people just giving the money, and you have people who are adding value. You want to understand, do they really add value? Most of the angels, angels want to put themselves that, yeah, I want to add value. Adding value in a startup means tens of hours of work in a week. The startups I work roughly with are about 10 hour a week. I work with them. And, and that's a, that's a full-time work. And I can only manage about six active startups. Some startups I just give money and, and I'm available if you have a need, but I don't, I'm not active in helping you. But you want to have angels who actively help you because that's a compliment to your team. And, and uh, at the time when you can't employ the right people. Uh, VC wanting, uh, sorry, startup wanting to raise money with the VC. One thing what you want to know is that are they able to make follow-up investments? Because if you go on VC game, 
it's a 20 million you have to raise, or the 100 million. And the, and the first invest, investment sign, the millions still. You want to know, are they capable of making follow-up investments? If, if you do an investment or raise a VC capital on the first, like the fifth year of the fund, they are able to make follow-up investments for the next five years. But after that, they are not. Typically, fund the limit is 10 years. And if your plan calls that yeah, you, you are going to need investments for six, seven years, that investor might be out of money to reinvest in your company. And, and that's, that's a bad situation. You would like to have a VC which still has a long run time that they can do reinvestments in the company. Uh, Bill Reinhardt from Garage Ventures say that the only mission of VC is to help the startup to raise the next round. In average, a VC investor works with a startup about three hours a month. That VC is not going to be the active help. They have a portfolio of 20 companies, someone in the early stage, someone at the exit stage, someone in the trouble. Your company doing okay, you are not going to get the time. They are not going to be in, but that's their mission, is really help you to raise the capital at the next round. Uh, if you looked on the company and really on the five stages, and what kind of roles you need from the investors, really, it, there's a different role and different kind of investors you need when, when you're doing the finding, the validation. You need someone who is really willing to put their hands in the dirt and, and has a, maybe the business knowledge, what you need, etc. You need the different investor when you are in the build stage. This finding and validating is totally different as the building. As the team has to change, the investors have to change. People who have knowledge of how to take the company in worldwide, in the bigger markets, bigger turnover, more employees, how to structure the company, which have hundreds of people. And then you have a different investor who has knowledge about how to do the exit. And this one also, you have to think, what stage are you actually in? What kind of investor do I need? especially if you want the added value from the investor. Myself, I'm typically on working today on the finding mode because I find that exciting. Being kicked out from the customer is exciting for me because that's only a challenge, how, how to go back and how to learn more. Uh, I have experience on building. I have done two exits. I'm not a professional at all on that. There are much better people on that. And same way, you should analyze the people whom you speak with. Ask direct questions. It is, I, I'm a thousand, uh, thousand startups, eight people asking me, why did you invest? It's, it's like, I, I find it strange. Every time when that, on my company, when the customer did not buy, I always went back to them, why did not you not buy? What could I have done differently to make you to buy? What was the problem? I always did that. Even today when the investors saying I'm not going to invest, I call them back and say, okay, what, what was the thing? What did you see we didn't see? Because saying no actually gives a great opportunity to learn. Saying yes, it's harder to learn. Few tools, I think so. I liked, uh, we were discussing a business, uh, business model canvas. Uh, I, I, sorry, Patrick, I prefer Lean Canvas myself. Well, I have made my own canvas for that. There's a one uh, which we did with the Lean Startup Machine. It's a validation board. How, how, how going on the idea and how validate and how, how to figure out that is there any, any idea on this thing? Uh, this is definitely one of those. And then when we did the first Lean, uh, Lean Startup Machine in Helsinki this autumn, it was great to see the people that how in a weekend the thinking evolved. The few teams who didn't evolve, there was actually one team which I had to go to kick out 
they were just sitting and discussing each other. All the time is running out, go out, out of the building. But yeah, it, it was great to see. It's a nice, great practice. I definitely, when you do, if you do a startup training, this is a nice game and to learn on, on the lean thinking and the custom validation. You sh definitely should use this tool, even as a game. As uh, what longer you go, that harder this is to like work on on a structured way. But as an experiment, when teaching people and teaching wannabe entrepreneurs how how do you validate this is a great tool. Uh, I had I had hard time on training startups on the business model canvas. I had to spend more time in training them on what's a business model canvas that I got really frustrated. Then I went on the Lean Canvas, a little bit same problem. I had to train them first on Lean Canvas. And then I made my own canvas, which is a simpler way again to do it. It's a linear thinking way. It has the problems, it has the things what they are. We, and that, because that many times I found disturbing on startups that they did, they looked at the canvases, but they did not figure out what's left out of the canvas. And, and they missed some important parts. These tools are really great. We do, we do Lean Canvas, or, or then my canvas with the startups. We do about between six to 20 different models of this in the beginning. And then we've tried to prioritize them, which is the most we think that worthwhile to validate first. And then we hit the validation really hard. We built mock-ups, presentations, vaporware, whatever. And then we hit the customers. We go out of the building and meet the, face the reality and try to face that really hard, fast. And we may try to make the experience such a way that we fail really fast. That if you get one yes, you raise double the price for the next customer. And then you double again until you begin to get the no's. And you change the business model on such way that it, it's a uh, customer hard to say yes. Because typically, startups tend to try to push, for example, pricing low end. And, and actually, when the startups actually should be trying to find what's the high end of that pricing. I have a startup which uh, wasted 1 million euros, almost went bankrupt. They had a product, but they thought the product at 15,000 euros too expensive. And they wanted to the build a product which cost 10 euros. And they built the product from that version to 10 euros. No business, we went to 1 euro, no business, we went to 10 cents, no business. This is the 90% savings. No business. And then we almost ran out of money. And then we said, oh, we are a little bit in trouble, but we had this original product, 15,000 euros, we had to make more cash. Let's price that to 25 euros. 25,000 euros, and it went off. We had been continuously too cheap. No one took us seriously. That company was almost bankrupt a year ago, autumn. This spring, they raised about 3 million from US VCs, and go, going really fast. That, yeah, you tried to push it cheaper, when really we should have been pushing higher, and understand what was the customer. But you, it's... You always want to buy cheap, then you try to also, also to sell cheap. Thank you. So uh, while I start with questions, uh, which, which I have, I have a long list of them, uh, after each one I, I still give you an opportunity also to, to ask a question, otherwise I will uh, use all the time what's uh, left for us. Um, uh, you ended with um, getting out of a building is important, and, uh, but before you do that you have to um, be sure that uh, what you are actually going after for. Uh, that you have to do different versions of, of your models and so on. Um, right now, uh, with Idea Lab, we actually today we are having in Riga we have a, s a small event for exactly the same purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, we are sending uh, student teams uh, out of the building, and um, um, I have a question re regarding that. Uh, usually. Uh, you can take it as an exercise because you, in very short time you have to physically 
go out of a building and you might not actually find the right customer or it might be difficult. Is it still worth going out of a building and uh, validating your idea with maybe not the right customer, but close enough customer? It's, you always want to try to find the, you can't go out and just face the first one. Mm -hmm. Because you have to understand that he represents the customer you are roughly going after. Mm -hmm. If you are validating a business in, in Estonia and Finland, it's hard. Small markets, not that big competition, etc. You really fast, you have, want to validate certain things here. And then you really fast, if you want to, if you want to build a local company, great. I invest also local companies. I have few companies, no exit, no growth path. Etc. One of those is be my best investment ever done. It's in two years returned the capital twice now. That it's it, local companies can be great. But if you go aiming for a global market, you have to understand what's a representative. That it doesn't mean yeah go and meet any customer. Mm -hmm. It has to be representative. And it, and is it like you might find an a customer in Finland? Lots of startups in the in the medical or basically healthcare. Finland is not a representative country of worldwide of a medical care because it has a specific government thing. It's, you might feel, find few countries, but going to UK or Germany or US, totally different. And then the customer is, if you succeed in Finland, it's not validation of anything. Mm -hmm. Okay. Question from the audience. Yes, we have. Let's take this and that. Hi, Senior, founder of students.de. Thank you for a great value in the presentation. My question is, um, what are your typical exits? And uh, I mean the ROI, where do you, when do you expect them to have if you invest in the company, either local or the ones who are targeting the global market? The question was, what are the typical exits and what's uh, return on the invested capital? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm the wrong guy to answer. I'm, I'm, uh, there, it's one personality that what I left out from this is Mr. X. <laughs> I value businesses. My best investment is a startup started 28 months ago. Two weeks ago, the turnover crossed 30 million and their profit crossed 6 million. No exit potential. But I have structured the investment such a way that already had twice the capital return. And next year again, maybe third time, etc. That I, I already got in, in two years the two x back. It's it's uh, typical investor looks for ten x. That's what you speak because there's so many failures. Uh, angels really you need to look even bigger return because the angels typically take bigger risks than VCs take. Okay, VCs invest more money, but the probability that the company angel has. And then coming on ROI, return on capital, it's uh, my so far. It's, it's like even I have this uh, few good ones. It's, it's about the level of what you get on renting a building. <laughs> it's, it's a worldwide, putting a worldwide perspective, uh, United States angels, we don't calculate the ROI, it's, it's IRR, internal rate of return, technically what we do. In the US, it's about 27% on angels. In the UK, it's about 24%. That represents about 18% yearly interest. But it's, 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 it's an okay business if you do it right. The average angel returns is zero. <laughs> and then you have the difference, fools or angels. The biggest, are there any angel investors in the group? The biggest mistake angel investor can make is to fall in love with the product. That's, that's what I did. None of the companies still anymore exist. They had a great product. I fell in love, yes, it's solving my problem. Okay, but how many Petris are there in the world? Blue-eyed Finnish speaking with the name Petri, not that many. And, and yes, biggest mistake, typically you get interested and you get excited. I'm working full-time with the companies, you still get excited about the product. 
And then you had, oh shit, now I had to go down again to the earth. How many representative, how, how represented am I? Angel investors are not represented of the typical customers. That's, that's a little bit the challenge what we are. Hello, I'm Markus Pala from Go Work a bit. And what are the best uh, ownership splitting principles? Best, the question was what is the best ownership principles? Uh, splitting. Yeah, I own everything. That would be. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's, I would prefer, before angels or investors coming, I would say someone has to be the majority. Someone has to be able to, in the worst situation, make the call. Does I, it mean that it, it's enough if it's 1% more than the others? Yes, it is. Okay. Yeah. It's just that in the worst situation, there are going to be cases, situations where there's troubles. And a startup haggling internal fighting of what, how to, what to choose, what the way to go is the hardest. And, and it, it gives a certain, certain thing. Or if you have three or four owners, then someone owns like that I'm 35 and then rest are then split equally afterwards. But they are not equal. That, that puts the perspective. Because if you have equal share ownership, it's put the equal expectations how you put time. I was called in a case where there's, there was a four guys started a company. There was a, the guy whose idea it was. He owned one fourth of the company. But he was an artist. He was working when he felt like that. And the rest of the three other guys felt that yeah, this guy is only partying and not working. Uh, he's not working enough, he's not putting enough as much as we are in the company. And, and they had the internal fight and then they called a couple out external people who yeah, come to help us. And, and this kind of situation really, yeah, if they would have not been equally split, the conflict would not have been that bad. It ended, this one guy was kicked out. They utilized what was on the shoulder agreement. Uh, one coming on this, in shareholder agreement, there's a term used called vesting, that how you actually earn your shares to yourself before you leave. Implement that on the shareholder, shareholder agreement from the start. That if people leave the company, and they will leave in the early stages, first three years, that the people really, they don't carry their shares. There is like something which they lose also when they're leaving. It's uh, too frequent we see a shareholder agreement that it's worthless. You want to have a good, employ a good lawyer that he makes a proper shareholder contract that takes consideration about the potential problems. And then you wish that you don't have ever have to look on that. How about this, uh, if this happens, then you get these shares. Do you like these clauses, that, uh, something in, in the line that uh, if uh, you can commit uh, full time, you will get 30%. Mm. If you can commit half time, you will get 10%. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's, that's one way to work on those. That because, and it, it is uh, like the things go, most of the startups run out of money. And there are people with the families they have to the support they have to leave the startup and go to work somewhere. And they might be able to put the night time, et cetera. But it's not the same. There's some one guy who has savings and living alone, he can work full time still. And then the input in the company, of course, differs. And you want to be able to adjust that one also. Yes. Uh, hi. Uh, I, uh, some uh, practical questions too. Do you have already had your six uh, uh, <laughs> companies this year? No, I do not. Do I have I made six investments? No, I have not. <laughs> I have a hard time finding good startups. <laughs> More questions from the audience? Yes. Uh, yeah, the question is. You met a lot of great teams and the bad teams. Uh, what are the three main reasons or the lessons you can share of the good team and the bad team that you have learned? Uh, OK, uh, the question was, what are the lessons different between bad teams and good teams? I don't know. 
I don't need meet bad teams. It's all the teams are good teams. They are not suitable to me. <laughs> that's that's the difference. And, and and typically with those I don't learn that much. It's really fast learning. It happens in typically in a week. Uh, one one thing what and we do loads of tests as I mentioned in presentation. We cause conflicts, and we see how you react in conflict. Uh, we make claims which we know that might not be true, and we, we look how you react on those. We might make the claim, yeah, we know this competitor is selling this many units and blah, 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 and he's much better than you are. And then we see how you react on that. A good team comes back with loads of data points. Yeah, I went and researched, I went and interviewed the customer. I know this, I know that, here are the facts. And you were wrong. We don't have ego, we are always wrong. It's, it's more that, okay, did he go and learn? How did he face the challenge? Or well, then you go, no, I don't believe on you. And you don't learn a single thing. And that's one of the difference what we do. That's a common thing why we walk away from a team. We, we made a claim and we see how they react and they didn't react anyway. Mm, not good in learning. Uh, I worked with the one company for a few weeks and really sending to customers is always problem was not to get the customer to understand him. And then you were telling, okay, what's the problem? Why that doesn't the customer understand? Because the customer is stupid. Okay, is there anything else? No, the customer is stupid. Okay, if we would do this way and you would go and listen and he comes back, no, the customer was again stupid. Okay, it's, there is no, some people you can't, they don't learn. There is that they don't have, might not have a need to learn. And they still might be successful entrepreneurs. It's, I can't, it's a good and bad team is wrong. It's, it's like there are teams that fit me and teams that don't fit me. Thank you very much. Thanks. And also for you, in order to survive a uh, venture uh, theme, uh, uh, some health products. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you.